find a hive that's being robbed out, I just put the robbing screen on, close it off for a day, or they could go next door to their weak neighbor and steal it. And that's what they're <laughs> going to do if they have that opportunity. There's other places that bag rock salt. And okay. there's a couple of places uh, around my area that bag rock salt and get a bunch of that. And I put it all around my hives, you know, and it would save me a lot of money and a lot of work, you know? Really? Yeah, okay. so that's really important. If you're gonna be in it for the long haul and you're gonna stay the course and have some longevity, you gotta look the big picture of things. The host yep. has enabled local recordings. Got yep. Um, yeah. So yeah, it'll, it'll record from your computer too, just in case there's like any like, mess ups or anything in the connection then okay. all nice and smooth and whatnot but yeah i'm glad it could finally work <laughs> so would have been better out there to have uh stuff on display but what the heck yeah just have to talk yeah, yeah i'm sorry about that well, well i'm a tech guy I, so i don't i don't know what's happening i don't know <laughs> like i said i'm pretty foreign to all this stuff oh that's okay i'm still kind of learning it all too um I haven't really, I haven't fully used this platform yet, so I'm still kind of learning all the kinks with it and everything. So, mm. so yeah. All right. Glad so where do we go from here now? But yeah, so welcome. Um, fun fact: you are my very first podcast guest. So thank you so oh, much wow. for taking the time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was uh, another site I was hoping to start with Beefit. Um, but I guess let's just start with uh, who you are, what you're all about, where you're from. Okay, uh, my name is Ryan Flannery, and uh, I'm in what they call Flat Rock, Michigan. It's a Flat Rock PO. I'm not really in Flat Rock, but I live out in the sticks, so we have to use Flat Rock as our uh, post office. But just south of Flat Rock <clears throat> in Monroe County. And uh, I'm the uh, owner or manager of Flannery Ridge Honey, LLC, and we sell beekeeping equipment and supplies uh, all around Southeast Michigan and Northern Ohio, Toledo area, Perrysburg, all the way over there and uh, <clears throat> carry everything but extractors. So anything you're looking for as far as woodenware, smokers, jackets, gloves, it doesn't matter. We pretty much have it all. Also, we've been doing bees longer than, <clears throat> excuse me, bees longer than um, equipment. So selling nukes and uh, packages and things like that. Uh, we've been doing for quite a while because when I first got into beekeeping, I wanted to expand things. So honey production came first and then nukes came second. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I saw that you've been beekeeping for 40 years. Is that right? Well, not really. Um, I was a teacher and a coach for 39 years. And uh, 56 years ago, my Uncle Andrew took me to my first beehive down in Virginia in his backyard. Uh, and that's, when, that's when I pretty much got hooked. Um, you know, the first time you pop that lid and those honeybees are all right there and you're like white knuckling it as a 12 year old, you know, that type of thing. But, you know, I be, was beekeeping on and off. Uh, mm -hmm. and then about 2013, I got real serious about it. Started expanding my honey production, started expanding my new, my new production. Okay. So we incorporated right about then. So it's been about 10, a little over 10 years with uh, the business. Okay. Awesome. <clears throat> yeah. You always have some really good information when you come out to uh, the bee club and, and speak and whatnot. Um, I remember, I think it was like last winter or it was like right around the springtime class meeting that, or uh, club meeting that we had, you had talked about overwintering bees on just sugar alone. Do you remember that conversation? Well, I don't know if it's just sugar alone. I, I, we use a lot of sugar. Okay. But they have some. Honey, they have some honey stores too. Uh, okay. So it's not just sugar alone, but sugar. Um, we pile on the sugar for winter. One as an insurance policy, in case they yeah. do run out of honey stores, um, they can make it through to March when we can supplement them and get them through into spring. Then uh, the other thing is, is that honey is more expensive than sugar. So I try and extract as much honey as I can and it's cutting yeah. a fine line, but I try yeah. and, you know, take that honey and sell it and replace it with sugar for the winter. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so okay. not honey, uh, not sugar exclusively, but a lot of it. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Casey and I have been trying out the same thing. We did that um, with a lot of our hives last year since I uh, made some really late splits, which I should not have done. So they did not have enough food going into winter or anything. Right. But um, yeah. But yeah. You got, you got to have at least uh, one good box of honey uh, for every box of bees you have. I like going in the winter with two deeps, you know, and they got the brood chamber below and the honey, uh, deep, the deep frames of honey above that. And of course, as the cluster moves up, the sugar bricks are right on top of them. Uh, mm -hmm. So as they move up into the top of the box, I have my shim there with my sugar bricks and my reflectics on there so it can push the heat back towards the bees. And then, of course, insulated inner cover instead of just a regular inner cover. <clears throat> you got to have a lot of insulation on top because uh, that's where your heat loss or cold comes in, just like in your house. Mm -hmm. So we have pretty heavy, heavy insulation on top of a hive with that reflectix and insulation. And of course you got your lid and then uh, we create an awning over the top of our <clears throat> beehive so that water drips away from the hive instead of down the sides between your wrap and your beehive. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Excuse me again. You're okay. Um, so what kind of insulation are you using on top? Is that just like the foam board or? It's the thick two inch uh, insulation and we put it inside a, a frame like a two inch shim frame with some plywood underneath it. And then you can throw that on top of your hive and it looks, it just looks like a super thick inner cover. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Like I said, we were going to do this out in the shop, but I couldn't get the Wi-Fi to work out. There I were, know. All the insulated inner covers were on display and the, the hive with the reflectix and, you know, and the sugar bricks are all in there, but, you know, couldn't get oh, connected. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, that makes me so sad. Well, you mentioned, uh, so do you wrap your hives then? General rule of thumb at Flannery Ridge is insulate early and wrap late. Now, okay. insulation is up top. That's heat okay. conservation. Wrapping has a lot to do with wind and other things. Not so much for heat conservation. The top of the hive uh, is a lot more important when it comes to that. So you can uh, put your shims on, your reflectix, and your insulated inner covers on early. You can put them on October. You can put them on November. You can wait till December if you like. But insulating the top doesn't really affect the hive very much. But when you wrap the sides and you have these warm days and cold nights, I find that it helps to create condensation, where if you wait till later in the year to wrap the sides, <clears throat> when the days are cold and the nights are cold, usually that's right around Thanksgiving or shortly after, that's a good time to wrap. Oh, okay. Yeah, I always wondered that about uh, the moisture buildup, but that makes sense to do it a little bit later so you don't get that. Well, if you have an airflow in your hive too, which you should have a little bit of airflow, that helps with condensation. Uh, okay. An open bottom, you can use a hardware cloth, you can use ventilated mouse guards or anything like that. No upper entrance. Uh, you're just letting cold air in, your bees are freezing. And then you have that slow exchange of CO2 and oxygen because the CO2 is sinking down. It's a little bit heavier than oxygen and it's slowly sinking down and going out the hive. And then the oxygen is, oxygen is slowly entering the hive and rising up to where the cluster is. And you have that slow exchange of uh, circulation of air, which uh, helps the bees breathe in one for one, but also helps with condensation. And again, remember that bees need a little bit of condensation. They have to drink water in the winter and mm -hmm. they can't get out and fly to get it. So they will lick off condensation off the side of the hive or uh, it, hopefully there's none in the lid, but they will do that if they need to because yeah. they're thirsty. <clears throat> And also to help moisten up that sugar that you throw on. So do you? Yeah, it absorbs, of, some, it absorbs some water too. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, do you I do like put, I put a bunch of sugar bricks on when I do it. So um, you know, like Don at the club and Adrian, he makes sugar pies. Um, yeah. But I don't have the equipment to really get out there and boil like he does. Even though it's great what he does, um, I don't have the time to stand out there and watch the boil and stuff like that. So I use the oven method. And I just use 12 pounds of sugar with about nine ounces of liquid and uh, tamp it down, put it in the little disposable bread pans and stick them in the oven for two hours. And I can make batches that way and still not have to stand out there and watch it boil because I can work on my laptop during those two hours when it's cooking. 
Yeah. But yeah, lots of sugar bricks. Uh, like I said, out in the shop, I had display. You know, I'm putting at least four sugar bricks or more per hive on there and then replacing them throughout the year as they eat them up. Because on a, you know, a nice sunny day in December or January or February where it's 45 and sunny, I'm going to crack that shim where that reflectix is. And I'm going to look inside and make sure they have sugar. If they ate it all, I'm popping in two or three or four more bricks real quick and then shutting it, which only takes about 30 to 60 seconds, depending on how prepared you are before you crack that lid. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm hoping to try out um, some sugar bricks this year. In the past, I've just always um, just put a bunch of sugar in a big mixing bowl and then put a little bit of water in there and mix it all up until it looked like, like wet sand and then just threw it straight same on. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much same yeah. difference. I mean, you know, you're, doing, you're doing a little homemade thing, but I use yeah. those little Gordon, uh, Gordon aluminum, the soft aluminum bread pans that you make like zucchini bread in or banana nut oh, bread yeah. or any of that stuff, you know, and just make, we make one pounders and pop them in. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, so I guess I'm going to bounce around. Sandy, I got to give some props to Sandy. She's the cook. She does all the cooking. All I do is get the big drill and the, and the, and the paint stirrer out in the, in the, in the five gallon bucket. And I just stir like mad, you know, and get that stuff. Yeah. Mixed. No, that's awesome. Having somebody to help is huge. I am so thankful that Casey likes bees too. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Make, it's a yep. game changer. Um, so yeah, I'm going to bounce around a little bit, I guess. Um, so how did you even get started with the, the bee store that you have that you're building? What made you want to start? You know, um, two things got me started. One was, is I was selling nukes I'd always have a ton of equipment for myself, right? And then usually in the old days, um, you ordered it unassembled and you spent all winter planing it down and getting everything level and gluing it and nailing it yourself. And so I'd make a bunch of equipment up and then people would come by and pick up a nuke and say, hey, you got an extra you know, box, you got an extra bottom board, you got an extra lid. And before you know it, I didn't have enough equipment for myself even, let alone for them. So I thought, what the heck? You know, I'm just going to start getting some in and selling it, at, you know, and making it put out, have a little area. And it was really little, really little area with just a bottom board, a lid and a box on display. And people come in and say, hey, I'll take that, that and that, you know. Mm -hmm. And before you knew it, it just grew from there and, and pretty much into a monster and to the point now where that's my main business is beekeeping equipment, not honey or nukes anymore. You know, even yeah. though we do that quite a bit in that. Uh, the beekeeping equipment has been very lucrative. Wow, that is awesome. So, okay. So what is your, what does your bee yard look like now? Have you ever, so you said well, you- back here, back here, I call this the home yard. This is my teaching or mentoring yard. And when the club came out last month and went, uh, they winterized my hives for me, they, uh, we had a little like a, uh, clinic in the shop, took about 45 minutes to an hour, went over the whole winterization process that you and I just skimmed on. And then they went out in groups of two or three. And uh, my son had all the equipment there for him, the shims or the feeders or the sugar bricks and reflectics and all that. And they broke up into groups and they all took a hive and winterized it so they could get hands-on field work experience. And uh, so this is the yard that I use a lot of that for. And there's because it's in my backyard and I only live on three acres and I have neighbors, I really can't have more than 40 hives back here or, you know, okay. more than that. It gets to be a little crazy in the environment, <laughs> if yeah. you know what I mean. Neighbors Sounds pools like and things it. like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, between our, our queen mating nukes um, and <clears throat> when I do have nukes here, I have like two or three hundred for a several week period. <clears throat> Excuse me. But with the queen mating nukes, we end up with a lot because we'll end up with 30 or more queen mating nukes on top of the hives and things like that. And they all have at least two, maybe three frames in each queen mating nuke. And, and there's bees in there as well. So mm -hmm. uh, that's enough for back here. <laughs> oh, definitely. How do you get it's them great, from robbing each other so much? What's that? Uh, how do you get them from robbing each other? With having so many condensed in like an area, that's one of the Robbing things screens. I was struggling. Yeah, <laughs> you gotta walk out. Gotta walk out past your hives every day, and you gotta watch yep. the activity. Is okay. it orientation okay. flight, or is it robbers going back and forth waiting to try and find a spot to get in and up and over the other bees? 
Do you have yeah. a lot of black bees? Hairless bees that are black are robbers. They've been in so many fights, they don't have any hair left. Things like that. So you're looking for all that. When you find a hive that's being robbed out, I just put the robbing screen on, close it off for a day. Then I open the top entrance. If you've ever seen a robbing screen, open the top entrance and the bees in the inside hive get out, but the robbers haven't figured it out and they're trying to, still trying to get in the old lower entrance. And you can leave that for a day or two. And when the robbers quit clinging to the screen or the front of the hive, they've pretty much quit coming to that hive. And uh, then you can open up the lower entrance and see if they come back or not the next day. And if they don't, you can take the robbing screen off or just leave it on, leave it open like that. But every yard that has anywhere from one to 10 hives should have at least one robbing screen in their equipment somewhere. So that mm -hmm. when one of their hives is getting picked on, you can always throw that on instead of pulling your hair out and having to run and drive an hour and a half to go buy a robbing screen for somebody real quick and come back. You know, you should just have one on hand because it can yeah. save a whole hive and a whole hive is worth a lot of money. And oh. all the honey, all the honey gets robbed out. So you lose all that too. Yeah, exactly. Especially yeah. Having robbing screens on hand is really, really good. And of course I have more than one on hand, but, uh, yeah, you got to have that um, if you want to save your bees, save your honey and stuff like that. Because bees are like water. They'll take the path of least resistance. And they could fly a mile in this direction and work their butt off and collect all this stuff and bring it back. Or they could go next door to their weak neighbor and steal it. And that's what they're <laughs> going to do if they have that opportunity. You know, yeah. once they get the, And once they learn robbing tendencies, your whole yard is hot for a while because, you know, they're going to keep trying – Find the weakest hive in your yard all the time. So once they learn those robbing tendencies, <clears throat> it, it's a tough season <laughs> after that. So okay. you try not to let them learn those. Try not to let them learn those robbing tendencies to begin with. Keep everybody yeah. strong. Keep everybody healthy. If you have a weak hive, combine it with another one. Do something else, but try to keep those robbing tendencies away that they don't learn those. Okay. So when you say robbing screen, are you just talking about like um, like hardware cloth, like a piece cut out or? No, because like the other bees can get in through that. Um, it's really, really fine hardware cloth that neither the inside or outside can go through. Uh, yep. Bees on the inside, bees on the outside. And then you've got little uh, silver pieces of aluminum that we bend and put screws in. And you can lift that up to create a little entrance. It's almost like a piece of silver over your wooden entrance reducer. And then you've got one on top of the robbing screen that's about uh, eight inches, 10 inches up above. And when you open that one up, the bees that are that come to rob, they go to the lower entrance and there is a screen there and they could smell the honey inside. They could smell the bees. So they never go to that top little slot, but your bees on the inside know and they go, they go in and out all day while the robbers are still clinging to the front like mad trying to get in. Yeah. But after a while, the robbers give up and then... Mm -hmm. uh, when, once they give up, you can open up that lower entrance. I, you don't want to take the robbing screen off right away because the robbers may come back. So you open up that lower entrance for a day or two, monitor that. And if everything's copacetic, then you can, like I said, take the robbing screen off or leave it on. But it's a, it's framed in wood. Um, it looks like a queen introduction cage. If you ever had a wooden frame for a queen, that's an you know, introduction frame or something like that. kind of looks like that that you put on the front of your hive where your entrance is. Okay. I had those on display too. I mean, <laughs> we were going to do. <laughs> oh, oh man. <coughs> That's okay. We'll make the Someday most of it. We'll have to do a podcast in the shop and it'll be Oh, really definitely. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I was actually thinking about that. I can possibly come out and um, see you there, see everything you got set up and everything. Give yeah. us a tour you of your yard. <laughs> I can hand you the equipment. You can model it while I talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could do that. <laughs> definitely. So, Okay, I guess a personal question for me because Casey and I are trying to figure out how to really just like get rid of small hive beetles. So we had a really bad problem with small hive beetles. I never really took them seriously. Um, I always thought, okay, if the hive is strong, then they're going to keep them in, in, like in control and everything and nothing's going to happen. But the problem we saw this year is the small hive beetles even if the hive was strong, they somehow would weaken the hive so much that it ended up collapsing. So what do you, what have you found to help a small to hive? To me, hive beetles are the worst, M much worse <laughs> than mites, much worse than wax moss, uh, maybe even worse than yellow jackets, which is saying something because they, you know, they're pretty bad sometimes. Yeah. But hive beetles are the toughest and the worst. Um, and you got to do take many different avenues 
to really keep the hive beetles in check. Uh, having a strong hive will help, like you said, but that's not the panacea. I mean, from the time you crack that lid, hive beetles are going to be up in on the inside of that lid. You are going to physically smash them. All those adults smash them because they're really hard to kill. They're so hard. You're going to take a look on top of those frames immediately, smash all them. Um, you're going to start working your way down into, the, into those frames. And if you have empty frames and there's like 30 or 40 hive beetles in an empty frame, you're going to take that and, and, you know, get rid of that because that's nothing but, you know, hive beetle heaven right there. So to not have very many empty frames where hive beetles can hive and you cannot have inner covers when you have hive beetles. Where's the number one place a hive beetle is going to hide? Above the inner cover in those little cracks around the rim that they can get in to get away from the bees, even though the bees are trying to put them in beetle jail. Uh -uh, there's too many <laughs> hive beetles for them to do that. And then the hive beetles can go down and raid when they want. And they make such a mess in the hive with the honey and the oh feces gosh. and eating through and doing everything. It's, it's horrible. But you have to have full frames, okay, with bees on those frames. They mm -hmm. can't be, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to take this super full of drawn wax and put it on top. And then the bees haven't come up to work on it because that's going to be high beetle heaven too because it's a place to hang out and get away from the bees. On top of the inner cover, it's a place to hang out, get away from the bees. So you're creating an environment for those high beetles. And then you can use other things like beetle blasters with the canola oil in it or the, the, the beetle attractant in your mm -hmm. upper boxes in the back so that your own beetles get chased into there instead of the yeah. upper uh, inner cover and they get chased in there. But the number one prevention is to kill the hive beetles while they're gestating in the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them, most, in fact, most of them, there are some that might stay in a hive over winter if you got nice warm hives. But most of them, they go into the ground for winter and they hibernate there. And then they uh, hatch their grubs and they hatch in the spring and come up into your hive. So if you kill the grubs in the ground around your hive, you're going to have very low hive beetle problems because you're killing them before they can even hatch, become adults and go into your hive. And mm -hmm. there's chemicals you can use that I try to stay away from them, but I know people that do use them. It's very effective, like Guard Star, and uh, some people use this Grub X and things like that on the ground all around their hives. But I just use rock salt. I go to the, uh, what do you call it, the, oh, the county, the county that the uh, uh, county road commission. Oh, stuff yeah. Again. There's other places that bag rock salt, and okay. there's a couple of places uh, around my area that bag rock salt and get a bunch of that. And I put it all around my hives. And uh, when you put it all around your hives, you got to make it thick. You got to make it white like snow. Okay. And then you got to get it at least, you got to get under your hives, but you got to get out in front of your hives and out behind your hives. Yep. And I would say a minimum of three feet in front, three feet behind, preferably more than that even. But still, it's 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 a lot of rock salt, but rock salt's not expensive. You know, mm -hmm. I think it cost me um, $4 a bag last year. Um, oh, that's and, not bad. And to do all my hives, it only took me like 30 or 40 bags of rock salt. So okay. compared compared to other things, that rel that's relatively cheap. But yeah, you got to get it in there and you got to get them. And then once that the rain starts to hit or the snow starts to melt, um, it just takes that rock salt slowly, keeps seeping it into the ground, and it kills those grubs before they have time, to, those high beetle grubs before they have time to hatch. And the other bonus is you don't have to cut grass or weed rack around the hives for about three months. <laughs> it doesn't kill the weeds or the grass, but it really stunts it. You don't really have to start cutting until about July. <laughs> oh, that would be nice. Definitely. You don't have to weed rack or anything because that's rock salt just stunts it, you know, keeps everything growing. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah, we're definitely going to try that this year because um, we got some pollination hives that came back from California. And I think we imported so many small hive beetles in them because we had them in all our hives and they were managing them just fine until right around fall time, they yep. just started decimating the hives. And no I hear that they can eat the eggs too, small hive beetles. They, do just, they, they burrow them? through and destroy everything. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they mess up, they mess up the cells and the wax with their feces and they turn everything into, a, they turn the honey into a putrid mess. I mean, it's just nasty. Uh, like I said, high beetles are the worst, but yeah, importing bees from uh, a place, 
I guess that you like Florida, Georgia, California, you might get a lot of that. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> I worry with it's because that. with those commercial beekeepers, it's a fact of life. They have tons of high beetles and they just treat with chemicals, treat with chemicals and then ship the bees off to who knows where in Michigan, Ohio, or Indiana, wherever. And it's not, and then it's not their problem anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Have you noticed, um, a difference in like the bees and their longevity dependent upon if they were like commercially bred or just like backyard beekeeping bred? You know, bees, genetics, people put a lot of stock in that, but bees are bees, just like yeah. dogs are dogs. Yeah, there's different breeds, but you know, I take in the old days, I just did an experiment and I would have, uh, 50% of my bees and 50% of bees that I had brought in and winterized them. Mm -hmm. And in the spring, I had the same result. Half of these bees lived and half of these bees lived. And it pretty much was almost the same ratio all the time, no matter what. So a lot of it comes down to your winterization techniques, um, your beekeeping knowledge going into winter, which means you're starting in April, getting ready for winter, keeping those hives healthy, keeping them strong, having enough honey, having them pest free, treating for mites, doing all those things. And mm -hmm. even with imported bees, the results were good as long as you were an A plus beekeeper. Uh, yeah. But a lot of people aren't and a lot of beginners aren't and it's not their fault. You mm -hmm. know, they just don't know what they don't know. And when you, I don't recommend getting bees from uh, other states like Georgia, Florida, California, if you're a beginner, because it's going to make your job much more difficult and you're going to get frustrated and want to quit. Yeah. Yeah, mm. definitely. But, uh, but yeah, having local bees, I think is an advantage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cause usually the local bees that are overwintered are, are overwintered by much higher grade of beekeeper. So the quality <laughs> of bees you're going to get from them are probably pretty good. Yeah. Yep, and they already adapted to the area too, so they know how to kind of prepare. Because like one of the things I kind of noticed was like some of our colonies, it's like they didn't even think winter was coming. And they would just, they had their brood nest up so high and they were just burning through all the stores so fast. Not even like as if they weren't planning that winter was up right around the corner. It's been so warm. We've had such a warm fall. They've been so active that they're eating through tons of their honey stores. Mm -hmm. Checking on my beehives, they are really consuming the honey, which means I'm going to need a ton of sugar on top of mine. My observation hive in my shop, they've almost consumed 100% of the honey, which means now I got to take it apart, put frames of honey in there, or put in a bunch of sugar bricks in the slots and do something. But here it is, it's barely mid-November, and they've gone through half of it's a nine frame hive and they had five frames of honey. So they've gone through almost all their honey, which four frames of bees and nine frames of honey above them should have lasted them almost till January or later. Yeah, definitely. Um, so that's happening out in the yard now, because when I see that happening in the observation hive, you know, that's an indicator for me to go check my hives and the same mm -hmm. thing's happening out there. They are just going through the honey left and right. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get much of like a goldenrod flow this year? No. No. Yeah, we didn't no. get much where I'm at either. We got the golden some rod didn't pollen. produce much nectar at all. And the pollen that was on it, which is the reason I love goldenrod, is that goldenrod pollen is like the second most nutritionist pollen a bee can have. And going oh. into winter for spring, that's what they need stored away. But the goldenrod pollen um, got wet several times and it took days to dry out or it got knocked off. And it was just not a great year in my area, at least for golden yeah. rod. Yeah. Okay. How was your main flow this year? Did you guys What's have, a lot of, how was your main flow this year? Did you guys have any problems with like drought and whatnot? Throughout the I'll summer? tell you what, uh, May and June were excellent. Got yeah. a little droughty in July, mm -hmm. but um, I always take my honey off early. I don't leave it on. I don't want my honey weight to start going negative where the bees are consuming it instead of bringing mm -hmm. in more nectar and, and making more honey. So by mid-July, I'm taking off my honey supers so that they're the heaviest they can possibly be. Because if you wait till August, the bees are consuming more honey than they're bringing in and your, your honey weight's going down, down, down each one of those supers. And mm -hmm. if you wait till the goldenrod season, you're gonna have very, just small amounts of honey 
uh, to sell. Okay. All right. So I never, I never use goldenrod honey for myself or for my customers or anything like that. That's for the bees for winter and that's yep. for their stores. Yeah. It always smells pretty bad too. So. <laughs> oh, when I was a young beekeeper and the first time I went out there and I'm in the back of the hive and I'm, what is that smell? Oh my God. What is that smell? And I have a strong <laughs> stomach because I was a boy's PE teacher for years and I spent years in a locker room. So I'm like, what is that? <laughs> Yeah. It's not like little worse to me. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah which speaking of, you said you're um, a track and field coach currently? I was. I coached oh, track was? for like 42, 43 years. Yeah, I coached at Siena Heights for like eight or nine years, Siena Heights oh, University. Right. And then I coached high school track at three or four different uh, high schools uh, for mm, 30 years or more. Yeah. Yeah. Right that's awesome. I started, yeah, I, started in, I started in the 81 season, so I don't know how long ago that was. But yeah, but yeah with, with my health uh, and with my health issues that I've had, uh, a mm -hmm. few years back, I had to resign from the uh, college track pros and program at Siena. Oh, okay. And, uh, start cutting back a little. Yeah, definitely. What you need to do because I'm almost pushing 70 now. And uh, the, the nukes are killing me. I'm going to have to start cutting back on my nuke production. Uh you know, shaking out bees and making packages is so much easier than growing nukes, carrying nukes, checking on queens, making sure they don't swarm, feeding them. It's just just a lot of work uh, compared to the other. And uh, the beekeeping business is so busy then and it's doing so well that I've got it between honey production and bees and uh, beekeeping equipment. Uh, I just got to cut back on one of them. And nukes seems to be the most obvious choice is limit the amount of nukes I'm going to have this year, which I've never done before. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you're, you're doing, you're running it all yourself then with uh, the yard my, and the. My son who swore he'd never get into beekeeping. He just turned 30 and he works for me on the weekends now and he's oh, learning nice. the business and he's, he's, he's hand makes all the, our frames, puts them together, you know, glues them and staples them and stuff like that. And he's, really starting to show an interest in the business now. But when I had him living here and he was, yeah, he was 15, 16. I ain't never going to have no bees. I hate these bees. Oh my God. <laughs> he's gone, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Till he cracks open his eye when he's older and he's like, Oh wait, maybe there's something to him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, he's a big hand now. Cause you know, with my health, I can't lift like I used to. And thank goodness I don't have 10 frame equipment because I, it would be really bad for me. Eight frames heavy enough for me at my, my age now. But uh, yeah, he does a lot of that. I mean, he's loading up supers. He's loading up boxes and hives and putting them in the truck and driving them up and things that I used to do, but can no longer really do efficiently. You know, he's doing all that. So he's, he's a big, he's, he's a big help. You know, I, awesome. I don't know how much beekeeping I could be doing if he wasn't involved. Yeah, definitely. So for you older people, make sure you get into five frame or eight frame equipment early in life. Don't wait till later like me. Okay. I wish I had a mentor <laughs> when I was like 20 or 25 or 27 saying, go into eight frame equipment. Don't do 10. You won't be able to do it later in life. You know, <laughs> and it would save me a lot of money and a lot of work, you know? Really? So is there's that what you like? There was, a point when I had to, there was a point when I had to dump all my 10 frame equipment and switch to eight just so I could continue my beekeeping career. Really? Yeah, okay. so that's really important. If you're going to be in it for the long haul and you're going to stay the course and have some longevity, you got to look the big picture of things and look down the road and say, you know, when I'm 60 or 65 or 70 or 75, 10 frame supers aren't doable. They're not doable. You know, I'm not Superman I was when I was young or thought I was, you know? <laughs> and uh, yeah. so... Thank goodness, you know, I, I, I switched over to eights, which I easily can make into a six frame hive just by adding stuff, frames on the inside or insulation on the inside or follower boards on the inside. And I can make all my eight frame, six frame hives real, real, really simple. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, they're very manageable for me now with my lack okay. of strength. And stuff. <laughs> Do you notice um, a difference between beekeeping as like an eight frame versus a 10 frame, or is it just pretty much universal the same? Just I like recommend eight frame in Michigan because it's a cold weather state. And okay. I find the success rate with eight frame is better than 10 overwintering because heat doesn't go this way. 
Mm-mm. Heat goes this way. And the narrower, the more narrow your equipment, the better for that. That's why nukes, five frames of bees with five frames of honey over the top, that whole nuke is warm during the winter because they can almost yeah. heat the whole box. I know bees can't heat the box, but the cluster is almost big enough to heat the whole nuke box. And they yeah. do very, very well. And then with eights, you can push the cluster in by taking out a frame or so. And like I said, making it a seven frame or six frame high for the winter by adding follower boards or insulation on the inside to push that cluster in and have less frames. So I really like eights because you don't have to buy a lot of fives. If you make your eights, sevens and sixes and so on during the winter. But, it, you know, with nuke production, I have a lot of nuke equipment. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Tell people, I says, you know, eight's the happy medium between five and ten, but you can make that eight a seven frame hive. You can make that eight a six frame hive in a matter of seconds, and you don't have to go and buy a custom made six frame hive. I think, uh, you know, what's his name on the internet? Michael Palmer. He's really big at pushing these six frame hives. See, that's the magic wand, six frame hives. You know, that's going to make you a master beekeeper. And uh, yeah. you can take an eight frame hive and make it a six frame hive in, in a in matter of minutes. Like I said, yeah. you don't need to buy all this custom equipment that later on when you want to dump it, no one wants it. Yep, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We found those um, two frame, the two gallon, two frame, um, just feeders that you put into a hive that takes out two frames. You put it in its place to help. Yeah. Keep down yeah. and then it's easy just springtime pour some sugar water in there close the top yep and for winter you can like i said put in pieces of insulation or wooden follower boards and you've doubled the r value on the outside walls and you push that cluster down and you've made it like a six frame hive or a seven frame hive instead of an eight really simple to do yeah and you have the equipment. you already have eight frame equipment so it's not like you have to buy anything special mm-hmm Keep, so you that dollar, about, keep that dollar in your pocket, as my grandpa would have told me. <laughs> so important, especially in beekeeping. All yep. of a sudden it starts snowballing, and then you're like, oh, hey, I just bought $2,000 worth of equipment. <laughs> <laughs> yep, definitely. Hmm. Um, so you mentioned that you have used 5 over 5. What do you think about that? Oh, yeah. So yeah. Like, 5 over 5 is great. The problem I have with 5 over 5 is wrapping it. I love bee cozies, even though they're expensive. I love them because in a matter of seconds, I can winterize a hive in seconds. I can winterize a hive, go to the next one, winterize it, go to the next one, winterize it with bee cozies. Uh, And up front, bee cozies are expensive. But Mm -hmm. over the course of years, they're not. Uh, The the long-term savings from a bee cozy is great. Bee cozy is great because some of my bee cozies are 10 years old. And I bought them back when they were cheaper. You know, they were like 30 yeah. bucks a piece or 29. Well, 10 years divided into 30 is three bucks a year they cost me. Where yeah, felt like paper that. or foam insulation that cracks and breaks and felt paper you have to, you can't reuse. It's all torn and cracked. Uh, actually, after 10 years, it's more expensive than bee cozies. So, uh, and bee cozies are quicker. You can put them on, put them on, put them on, be done with it. At the end of the spring, dry them out, roll them up, wrap them up, put them in bins, keep them away from the mice. And they're good till next season. So, yeah, you know, that that's really important. But you got to have the money up front for those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. You know? So how do you sell your hives up in terms of like, do you put them all closer for the winter or do you just leave them? Well, you, you don't have to when you have that insulation that I talked about up top. Okay. And you have, you know, um, all that reflectix on there pushing the heat back down to them under that insulation. And then you have your lid with an awning over it, which I use a thin foam piece of insulation that's cut six inches wider than the lid, six inches longer than the lid. So snow and ice drip away from the hive instead of on the front landing board or between your wrap and your wooden wear on getting all frozen cold. So once you do that, that piece of foam on top keeps the snow and ice off the lid. You just put a couple heavy bricks up there. Uh, And then once you put the bee cozy on, the wind from all those little micro holes between boxes that never really get sealed up is all kept down to a minimum because the hive is wrapped with those bee cozies. And, uh, you know, you're very much keeping the wind out when you're wrapping the sides and you're conserving heat when you insulate the top. Okay. So have you ever had a year where you've lost like 75% of your hives, almost all of your hives? In the old days, before I learned how to winterize effectively, 
Yes. Yeah. I had, you know, I had some years where I had uh, 68% loss. I had 65%. One year I had 50%. And, uh, you know, it can be very discouraging, but you, as a beekeeper, you can't let uh, a failure like that uh, be a source of discouragement. You have to use it as more of a stimulus to do better and be a better beekeeper. So uh, Matthew Kobe uh, pretty much winterizes the exact same way I do. I've watched his videos online, and we do almost the same thing. And I think James Lee at the Sustainable Beekeepers, he pretty much does about the same thing I do. And so quite a few of us in this area are doing that same thing with the uh, open bottom, ventilated bottom, uh, slow exchange of air, uh, sugar bricks, reflectix, foam insulation on top, uh, pretty much all the same way. And they're all having great success too now. Really? So that's one of the keys. In the old days, you'd find people say, hey, I, the bees need an upper entrance. I'm going to have this little upper entrance hole. And it's, all that does is let in cold air every 15 minutes. All the warm air has been exchanged for cold air and your bees are freezing to death. It's, yeah, no, different than, it's no different than going upstairs in your bedroom in the winter, turning the heat on, and then opening your bedroom window and going to bed. You're going to freeze. You know, and the bees are the same way. You can't have that air coming in up there where that cluster is. It's just rushing in. Even the smallest little dado hole, it's it's rushing in. Really? Okay. So, yeah, not having an upper entrance, but having that open bottom with a screen bottom board or wood or solid bottom board with ventilated entrance, like a hardware cloth or a ventilated mouse guard or something like that. But you can't put wood in front of that because wood's going to restrict that airflow that you desperately need because that's really your only source of oxygen and CO2 exchange. Mm. Okay, definitely. But if you guys ever get a chance and you want to see that, go to Matthew Kobe's uh, site and he'll show you have some videos on how he sets it up. And yeah. uh, who knows, maybe one day Emily and I can do that and we can show it and she can have it on her site. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I'd love to. So um, have you noticed anything? How has beekeeping changed over the years as you've been watching it? So I know you said you briefly kept bees a little bit when you were younger, but didn't really well, fully get into it. In the old days, it was a lot simpler because <laughs> uh, you didn't have to deal with high beetles or mites. Uh, years and years and years ago, when I you know, first was dabbling in that, we didn't have all those problems with pests. You know? Really? Not even hive beetles? The biggest problem that we're not in the United States, Sam, there were no, there were no mites. There wasn't, no, all we had was basically wax moss and that was it. But, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, the, the pest control thing was not an issue back then. But the biggest problem we had was lack of knowledge. There was no internet. There was no resources to learn from. You could buy a book maybe somewhere or go to the library, maybe find something. I mean, that was it. You, you, you were in the field doing hands-on, learn-by-doing school of hard knocks a lot of times. Unless you had a great mentor or somebody you could talk to that was successful, um, that was very de debilitating to people who wanted to be a hobbyist and have, you know, two, three or four hives, but have no one to turn to or no, nowhere to glean any knowledge from. Uh, mm -hmm. that, was, that was very difficult. So that has increased greatly. And that's added to our success in beekeeping now because the amount of research happening at these universities and different places is astounding. And the things oh, they're yeah. discovering and coming up with is just amazing. Oh, definitely. And that's really, really helped beekeeping. It's helped beekeeping. It's helped beekeepers. Oh, but definitely. Knowing what is the good information and what is the crap is the hard part. Because on the internet, there's a lot of good things. There's also a lot of bad things. And as a beginner, you don't know what to, what's good and what's bad. And that's where some of the problems is. And that's one of the things I, uh, I learned uh, later on in my beekeeping career was not to jump on the latest gimmick. Uh, I call it not falling for the flavor of the month. Okay. Here comes this new item out. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody wants it by next year. You're not selling a one of them because they were just junk and they didn't work out the way they said they would and so on. And, but you get a lot of that these days of people wanting to jump on the flavor of the month. You know, and my suggestion is to stick to the tried and true cornerstones of beekeeping and you'll be a lot better beekeeper. Find a good mentor, find a good club, and that's going to help you immensely. But also stay away from the current fads. Yep. Let them play themselves out. If they're worth a darn, in a couple of years, you'll know it. 
But if not, let other beekeepers be the guinea pigs for those new products. And, and, and if they fail, you won't be crying in your coffee. You yeah, know? definitely. Yeah, that's the cool <clears throat> thing about YouTube now is you can see how uh, how things turn out when they try different things. Right. You know, and I don't want to be the one trying them out. I'll wait till they, you know, become become a fit. You know, okay, these things are yeah. for real. Now let's try these, you know. But yeah, stay away from the flavor of the month. <laughs> yeah, definitely. What do you think the biggest lesson you've learned with beekeeping is so far? Good Lord, I don't know. Um, <laughs> or at least yeah. the biggest lesson that was a game changer for your beekeeping. That as soon as you realized it, like, everything started turning around. Well, I think I might mention two things. One is I'm so much better at observing bees now. Okay. I can pop a lid and watch these bees and tell you what's going on in the hive. I couldn't do that in my younger years. Mm -hmm. I could not do that because I was so focused or laser focused on doing an inspection or looking for the queen or something like that, you know, yeah. instead of, you know, looking at the overall picture first and see what's going on and watch what the bees are doing, how they're acting, how, you know, what, what's going on in that hive. That's really important. And with experience, you get so much better at that. And that just makes you so much better of a beekeeper walking by the front of the hives, watching the activity, going in and out, what's happening. Observe that, you know, yeah, are there robbers? Are, there, are they collecting pollen? Uh, are they acting funny in front of the hive? Are they bearding, you know, what's going on? So you're looking at all these things and you're not even going in the hive, you're just going down hive to hive, checking out each hive as you walk by. And you're yeah. observing, you know, and you're looking and say, whoop, look at all the drones going in and out, that hive's queenless. And you're going to the next one. You mark, put a little mark on that so you can go back later and then fix it and stuff like that, you know. Uh, just things like that have made beekeeping so much better for me because I've gotten better at it. And, and that's the key is, you know, I quit watching YouTube and I started watching my bees. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, did. Yeah. yeah, that is huge. That's something that Casey and I tried to do this year because the bees, they'll teach you. They're the best teachers. They're better than anything you can find. You just got to open your eyes. And when I first started beekeeping, I did. I was laser focused. You know, mm -hmm. I was, you know, I was, I was front end focused instead of watching everything. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So I got to ask the question now. So how do you approach Varroa mites? What do you do? How oh, do you get um, What's your method? All right. So um, <laughs> I take my honey off early, right? Yes. And I treat early. I treat by end of July it, if the weather allows. Yep. And when treating for mites, you must treat the brood first. It's very important that you do not put the cart in front of the donkey. A lot of people will get out their acid drip or their oxalic acid vaporizer and start vaporizing their bees, which yep. is a lesson in futility. And I'll tell you why in a minute. You must treat the, the, the mites that are in the brood because those are where the mite bombs are going to be going off. Each cell, those uh, mite, the mite will lay eggs in there and she'll have eight to nine to 10, 12 mites. When that bee hatches, those mites are going to hatch and they're going to have mite bombs going off in every cell. Well, you've got to kill those mites in those cells. And two ways of doing that is using like Formic Pro mm -hmm. or Mite Away strips. I prefer Formic Pro over Mite Away uh, for, for a reason. And then uh, also having bees that are have higher percentages of VSH traits, okay. that really helps because they will uncap those cells that have a ton of mites in them, pull that uh, larvae out, drop it off in front of the hive. And of course, the mites die too then. So mm -hmm. treating with uh, the brood first with uh, Formic Pro or Mite Away strips and then having a good quality queen that has a high percentage of VSH traits still um, that really helps at that first stage of treatment. But treatment for mites is a two-stage deal. Yeah. You treat the brood for at least 21 days or 20 days. Now, Formic Pro is a 10-day treatment with one strip. I never use two because you get too much queen loss and too much bee loss. And the temperature threshold is very important when you're using two strips. When you're using one strip, the higher end temperature threshold is not as important in the summer which is really important to know because it's 85 degrees, I think, with two strips. Well, there's a lot of days we have hotter now. You don't have a five-day period or more without 85. But when you have one strip in, 
it can go to 86, it can go to 87, and you're not going to get the loss you would have if you had two strips. So I do a 10-day treatment with one strip and another 10-day treatment with one strip. That gives me 20 days of the brood cycle, which is almost exactly what you need because it takes 21 days for a worker to hatch. So mm -hmm. it covers almost the whole brood cycle of the bees. And immediately on the 20th day or sooner, because sometimes I'll take those uh, pads off earlier because the efficacy of the pad goes downhill every day. The first mm -hmm. two, three, four days, it's really strong. But then after that, the amount of acid that's left in that pad is very weak. So sometimes, you know, I'll just do a seven-day treatment, seven-day treatment, seven-day treatment. And, you know, the pad's a lot more stronger during that time period. But basically, as soon as you take that pad off, you must immediately vaporize. Because the mites that are in the phoretic stage on the fur of the bees, you have to kill before they can lay eggs back into the brood and create that same mite bomb situation again. So yep. you must immediately vaporize as soon as you're taking those pads off. Vaporize, 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 vaporize. Five days later, vaporize again. Five days later, vaporize again. So you're getting all those mites that are on your bees now. And you mm -hmm. look at your little mite board or whatever and then do a and then do a mite check and all that type of stuff to see what your levels are at. You yep. know, but if you vaporize first before treating the brood and then do a mite check, everything's gonna look cool until those, all those mites that are in those cells start hatching and you're back on the merry-go-round again with yep. all the amount of mites and stuff. So yep. you've got to treat the brood first, then you got to treat the bees in the phoretic stage. And once you do that, your mite levels are going to be pretty darn low. Okay. But you got to have at least 15 days of, of vaporizing treatment every five days, mm -hmm. maybe more. Okay. And then I do like once a month after that. Once in, if I vaporize, and I'm into September. I'll do one in October if I get a nice day, one in November. And if I can get a nice day in December, I'll vaporize one day in December. Okay. <clears throat> you only um, treat usually in the fall time then? No spring treatments or or summer? Uh, I, I try not to use any chemicals. Yeah. Uh, you know, some people will use Apivar, Apistan, uh, all kinds of miticides, fungicides, all that type of stuff. Yeah. I try to stay away from that. And yep. I do treat in March before the queen starts brooding up. Okay. You know, because yep. when she's breaking that cluster in winter, she's going to start brooding pretty soon. She's going to start, you know, taking that little maybe baseball size cluster that she had in the winter or something like that. She's going to start building on that, expanding that. Mm -hmm. So if you treat then before, the, you know, she starts laying a lot, uh, that's the best time in the spring to do it. And that's usually about the end of March or middle of March, depending on our weather, or even beginning of March, depending on our weather. It's it's not a calendar thing. It's more of like, you know, a weather thing when she's going to start warming up, breaking cluster and starting to lay. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. But yeah. So treating, why early, treating early once, I like to do if I have the time and the opportunity. <laughs> but if, if you went through winter and you did your work in the fall, and you don't have many mites going into winter, uh, treating in the spring, I don't know, it's more its more like for your own peace of mind, because the bees okay. are usually in pretty good shape, you know? Yeah. But if you had a mite problem going into winter, then yeah, you're going to want to treat in March and try and help them out, because they might be close to not making it. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. Yeah, I've always so, wondered um, what happens with the mites when they go through that broodless period in the wintertime, if that helps it all kind of cut them back. Well, hopefully you've got them knocked out by then, like I said, by treating the brood and then treating the phoretic stage. And you yeah. don't have any mites, you know, hanging on your bees or your dead bees on the bottom with mites on them and things like yeah. that. That's the whole thing is to get rid of those mites because your, 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 your winter bees that you're going to have in March and April, um, they're born in July and August. So they need to be born mite-free because they need to be born virus-free. It's the virus that the mites carry that kill your bees. And yeah. uh, if you don't, if you wait till September to treat, um, your winter bees are almost, many of them are already born. And if they mm -hmm. have the virus, um, then that hive is dead girls walking. You know, yeah. I don't care how big and how strong it is. Uh, your mite load's going to be too high. The virus load's going to be too high. And by January, February, you're going to find them all dead on the bottom board or, or whatever in the cells of the, 
uh, the wax and things like that. But yeah, you, you yeah. want to take care of your treatment early, get your honey off. Cause I don't like treating, I don't like eating honey that's been treated. I don't care if it's a natural chemical or not. I, I get my honey off and then I treat right away. Yeah. It changes the flavor. I've noticed um, I've taken, I've treated with formic before pulling my honey off before and the honey just tasted odd. Like yeah, it tastes pull my, it's off. Pull my supers off, pull my supers off, extract them and put them on almost immediately. So the bees can clean them up, start repairing the cells, get a good meal. Uh, yep. And then treat right then because with that extra super on top, that's basically empty. It's got, you know, frames in it, but they're empty. It gives the bees a place to go and escape from that acid if it's too strong for them, especially mm -hmm. if it's a hot day. So if you don't do that, you can just add an empty super, nothing in it. And that way your bees can crawl up there and get away from the uh, strong acid if they need mm -hmm. to. Okay. And you so can also, vent, you can also vent the lid, vent the lid if you need to, or do whatever for a day. Cause that first day or two, that acid's pretty strong. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Ventilation's huge, especially having that um, bottom entrance open. Don't have any sort of entrance reducers in, or it will not right. be good. <laughs> um, so, why Formic and not Mitoway Quick Strips? It's cheaper in the long run for me. Oh, um, okay. Mitoway strips are seven day treatments. Yeah. Well, to go 21 days, I need three treatments. That means I need a pack and a half of Mitoway strips. Yeah. Proformic is a 10 day treatment. Well, mm -hmm. two strips is 20 days, still covered the 21 day brood cycle. So in the long run, even though Pro uh, Formic Pro is a few bucks more to buy per pack or per case or whatever, it ends up being cheaper because I only have to use two pads instead of three to cover the okay. brood cycle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've been hearing um some like reviews on the Mightaway quick strips and them like burning the brood a little bit more than Formic does. I didn't realize it was only seven days though. I've only ever used Formic. That would make sense. It must be a lot stronger for why it's uh, causing queen loss and burning the brood. And well, yeah. um, I, I I don't know if it was me or but the first year I tried to treat with pads, I used Mitoway strips, and I had uh, I probably had thirty percent queen loss in all my hives because mm -hmm. it was very warm on those days, and she's the most delicate bee in the hive, and it really affects her when that temperature yeah. gets up when that that pad is real strong. Uh, and then some bee loss too. Uh, you know, and I don't know if it's just chance the next year I switched to uh, Formic Pro and didn't have that issue. But like I said, it could have been me, could have been the beekeeper because 90% of all bad things are because of beekeeper error. We all know yeah. that. <laughs> the bees yeah. know what oh, they're doing. <laughs> yeah, we we're just trying to read their minds. <laughs> right. But for me, it's a monetary thing. Two, two strips, they come in a two pack of Formic Pro is cheaper than three strips of Mitoway. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, we're going to end this probably pretty soon. But before we go, my last question, why beekeeping? What made you fall in love with it? And why do you keep beekeeping? I'm a type A guy. And I always got to be doing something. Mm -hmm. So working all day, coaching track all afternoon and taking care of bees as soon as I got home kept me out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. I you can know, relate to that. You find something good to replace bad things. And yeah. beekeeping is a good thing, you know? Yeah, coaching definitely. and beekeeping were good things. So it keeps you on the straight and narrow. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some guys need that. Okay. But yeah, beekeeping, you know, the bees were in the first time I saw bees. And that lid cracked, and there's all those bees, and I was like fascinated. I mean, mm -hmm. that was like, aha, uh aha, -huh, uh -huh, this is something I like. <laughs> you know, <laughs> didn't take much to realize that. It's like, okay, this is good. You know, yeah. everybody else is running away. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm getting, I'm getting closer and looking, you know. <laughs> so you were never scared of them in the beginning? <laughs> no, you know, I played outside, you know, when the old days we didn't have internet, we got stung all the time. If, you know, we were, we were mosquito brain boys, we'd find a wasp nest, we'd throw rocks at it. You know, that's a good way of getting stung. <laughs> Things like that. We were always getting stung, you know. And then we're like, okay, I got you, B. And we'd pull the wings off it and watch it crawl around and say, there, see if you sting anybody else. But, you know, we were boys. We got stung all the time. So, no, I was not a, I was not afraid of them at all. Yeah. You know? That's awesome. 
but you know, well, we, we were like messing with them all the time. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, thank you so much for uh, being here with me today. And thank you for being the very first podcast guest I've ever had. Um, and well, thank through you. The digital part I of know, it. I know we didn't have much to demonstrate or show being in the house like this, but maybe some other time we can do a real professional job, you know, whatever, yeah. when you have time and, you know, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll have some gimmicks to hold up. Flavor of the month. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Definitely. I'd love to do that. I will definitely keep in touch about that. So okay, where can well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah. Where can everybody find you though real fast before we hop off? Uh, follow me on Facebook, not my personal Facebook page, but my business one. It's Flannery Ridge Honey LLC. And I'm not a tech guy. Like I said, I'm an old dinosaur. So I only post once in a while when I'm going to have some beekeeping classes. Uh, January, February, March, I might have some basic beekeeping 101 class, things like that. Uh, spring preparation class. Uh, we just had two classes here in the last month on winterization. Uh, stuff like that. Uh, announcement for packages and bees and mm, if I have a sale on equipment, but I only post like twice a month on my okay. Facebook page. So those people won't get a lot of junk in their feed, you know. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, Flannery Ridge Honey LLC on Facebook and you can follow us on there. It's pretty okay. much uh, unless you're unless, unless you happen to be driving by, uh, mm -hmm. you know, beautiful Flat Rock, Michigan, you can always stop by and check out the shop. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you have a storefront or are you just running it out of your, yep. your show? That's right what we're going to do. We, that's where we were going to do the show, but I couldn't get the uh, Wi Fi. Oh, out there. Okay. Yeah. So, like I said, all the equipment would have been there, all the hives, and then we could have held up things as we were talking. But hey, you know, live and learn. We'll figure something out, right? Yeah, definitely. Something to look forward to. I'll come up there and we'll make a whole thing of it. Great. So. You're, you're invited. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> all Thank right. You very well, much. Yeah, thank you for being here with me today. It was a pleasure. All right, you take care. You as well. Have a great night. All you beekeepers out there, stay positive. Yes, especially this time of year when uh, bee burnout is what I like to call it. <laughs> Beekeeper burnout and you're just going into your highs and seeing some of them collapsing can be really hard for especially new beekeepers to see that. It's a long journey. Stick with it. And, uh, you know, the, the road you travel will eventually get you there. Yeah. Yep. All right. Exactly. Thank you, Emily. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Bye, y'all.